hearing will come to order. We uh, apologize to the witnesses, and but we thank you for your patience. We had a series of votes, uh, plus uh, one unexpected one that took a considerable amount of time. So we'll proceed, and the uh, gentleman from New York is, is with us. We will be able to go forge right ahead. Let me ask um, uh, Mr. DeLordo, uh, yesterday uh, Colonel Davis testified, and in his testimony he uh, testified to the undue political influence that permeates the military commission process. Um, Much of Colonel Davis's complaint deals with the overly intrusive supervision of the prosecution by the current legal advisor to the convening authority, an issue which Judge Alred in the Hamden Military Commission case recently addressed. In the May 9, 2008 order, Judge Alred, a captain in the United States Navy, found that the actions of the current legal advisor, General Thomas Hartman, reflected too close an involvement in the prosecution of commission cases and suggested an, in, an improper influence on the chief prosecutor's discretion. As a result, Judge Elred ordered the disqualification of the legal advisor from further participation in the Hamden case. I understand that the legal advisor has been removed from the Hamden case. My first question, is that true? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, consistent with the judge's order in that case, there is a legal advisor who has been appointed to continue the... Um, he has been removed. There is a different one who has been appointed, yes, sir. Right, fine, thank you. And um, someone's been named in this place? Yes, sir, for that particular case. Okay. What's being done to eliminate undue command influence in all these military commission cases, Mr. Delardo? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I take issue with um, Colonel Davis's remarks in that regard. And I would cite to the committee the uh, report that has been posted on our website, the one that was done at the then General Counsel Jim Haynes' direction um, by um, Brigadier General Tate from the United States Army, uh, Brigadier General Hardy from the United States Air Force, uh, then Captain, now retired Admiral um, um, Tronberger, who looked into the allegations of Colonel Davis and came up with findings and recommendations that address those issues. And my reading of that report does not uh, concur with, I think, Colonel Davis's assessment of the situation uh, that prompted him to uh, resign from his position. Uh, Mr. Katzis. Yesterday, uh, Steve Oleski suggested in his testimony, and I'm sure I'm quoting it right, uh, that we should let the, this issue regarding the commissions play out in the courts before we attempt to legislate on the issue. Uh, Mr. Catyall didn't quite go that far, but he thought it ought to play out for a short while, as if I remember his uh, testimony correctly. Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Should we forge ahead, or should we wait till the courts have the opportunity to um, work more cases, or where do you recommend we go? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, is your question about the habeas proceedings or the yes, military? Yes, excuse me, yes. Okay. Um, my strong recommendation to the committee would be to legislate uh, standards, a procedural framework to govern the conduct of what are 250 unprecedented cases. We don't know such fundamental questions as what are the relevant 
burdens of proof. Um, what is the nature of uh, discovery obligations? Um, how is classified information to be protected? Is there an entitlement to live hearings? So uh, you have a tremendous potential for um, disparate rulings as district courts try to work through these issues. Um, you have the possibility of disagreement in the district courts, which will produce large numbers of reversals on appeal, which will slow down the process, not facilitate it. Um, in terms of Justice Department resources, uh, you would force us to relitigate the same set of issues at least three times, potentially 15 times or dozens of times, depending on the extent of consolidation. Um, and you would risk the courts not striking the optimal balance between the interests of fairness to indiv individual detainees and uh, legitimate mit uh, military needs in prosecuting uh, this war. And, and finally, I should just note that um, there is a 200-year tradition of congressional involvement in shaping the scope of habeas corpus. Statutory direction goes all the way back to the first Judiciary Act. It would not be novel or unusual for Congress to set down standards and guidance, as it always has with respect to habeas, um, as the Supreme Court invited in Boumediene and indeed, as Chief Judge Lamberth of the District Court um, has invited in a press release welcoming guidance uh, from this Congress. Thank you. How many detainees are there currently at Guantanamo? There are approximately 265. 265? Yes, sir. How many of that 265 have been formally charged? 21. 21. Yes, sir. When were those 21 detainees charged? Uh, Mr. Chairman, they've been charged uh, over a period of time beginning in, I believe, February of 2007 uh, through the present. Uh, first charges after the, um, well, uh, let me step back. We did have a number who had been charged prior to the Supreme Court decision in Hamden in 2006. Uh, there were about, I'd say, somewhere on the order of 5 to 10, although my, my memory may be off there. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision in, in Hamden, uh, we and uh, the Congress and the, and the administration um, put together the Military Commission Act. The president signed it, and then uh, we, started the we started the charging process over again for some of those detainees. Uh, so some of the 21 uh, who are now charged or have been recharged uh, post the Military Commissions Act. Will all of the 265, is that correct? Will all the 265 be charged with one charge or another? We don't expect that to be the case, Mr. Chairman. The, prosec the, um, the prosec chief prosecutor and the prosecutors who work for him will make those decisions as to which of the detainees uh, will be charged. The convening authority uh, will make a determination about which of those cases will be referred to trial. Un unfettered by any outside influence. Those are decisions that they will make. Uh, we have heard estimates from the Office of the Chief Prosecutor that somewhere in the order of 60 to 80 uh, detainees could be charged. Uh, but again, it, it's their determination as to which they will charge and what charges will be preferred. And we will have to see how that uh, plays out over the coming year. But I, I, would, I would expect that uh, that since that number has not changed very much, that probably on the outside, 80, uh, maybe slightly more, uh, could be charged or anticipated being charged. So you will have either around 200 or slightly fewer 
that you do not anticipate being charged. Is that correct? I think I think if you know, if I were to do the math, I think that's about right, Mr. Chairman. And what will you do with them? Well, we have um, we have a number of them who have already been uh, cleared for either transfer to their. How many would that be? That number is about. I think Ms. Hodgkinson has that number better actually than that? I do. Yes, sir. There, there's approximately 60 individuals at Guantanamo Bay who have already been approved for transfer or release back to either their home country um, or in the instances where their home country does not want them or they can't be sent there out of humane treatment concerns or security concerns, then we're seeking a third country. So 60 or so will be released one way or the other. Is that correct? Our goal is to transfer or release about 60 of them. Yes, sir. So you'll still time. have... But, but we do continue, sir, to have administrative 140, 150 that will still be there that you, do you anticipate charging them with anything? Well, well, I would note that we continue to have the annual administrative review boards, which have been very successful in approving individuals for transfer or release. To date, more than 500 people have gone home under this process um, and through our diplomatic negotiations. So those processes will continue at the rate that we have been doing so. Um, over the past year, we sent more than 100 people home under these very procedures, this careful process and these deliberate uh, negotiations with other countries. <coughs> And we intend to continue to do that for the remaining population that does not at this time intend to be prosecuted. So you will have approximately 140 thereabouts. I, I think I think that that's that, that uh, will not be charged and are there permanently. Is that correct? They that they will that number, um, give or take uh, a few, will be a difficult number to come to a a resolution. Uh, through either the military commission process or the release process, although as Ms. Hodgkinson indicates, we will continue to try to find ways to to either transfer them. Likely, they would have to be transfers because my understanding is the threat level for those is high, so high that they could not be outright released. But that you're right; that is a core number thereabouts that will be uh, neither charged nor, at least, not in the short term. Uh, they're they're transferred or released. Kind of like the man aboard a ship that couldn't get off the ship had because he didn't have a country. Is that basically it? They're stuck there. That uh, until the end of hostilities. Again, our basis for holding all of these folks from the outset has been uh, that they are enemy combatants during an armed conflict, much as we've faced in other prior wars. Are, Obviously, are, this one has gone are on they longer. Are they considered prisoners of war? They are not technically. They are not treated as prisoners of war under the third Geneva Convention. They are considered unlawful enemy combatants who are detained under the laws of war. Mr. Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I know I join with you in uh, apologizing to our witnesses for this bad timing and this long uh, delay here, uh, and I, I apologize for getting back a little late here. Uh, let me just ask you a few preliminary questions about Guantanamo, because I think the the public, uh, to the public, Guantanamo is a place that's been excoriated in the press, is a place that uh, people uh, think uh, uh, mistreatment occurs. So my, my first question is, uh, is there in, the, in, uh, in your estimation, and I would ask this of all the panelists, are the prisoners, uh, detainees being treated well at Guantanamo? And do you have any objections, or do you see any uh, problems with their treatment? And I just go left to right here. Yes, ma'am. I'll begin by saying, sir, that we believe that the detainees are being very well treated at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we have taken extensive measures and efforts to ensure that they have the highest standards of care that we can provide, um, both through medical care and treatment, which has a higher patient to doctor ratio than any other uh, facility that we're aware of. Um, we try to ensure that they have regular exercise and all detainees have recreation op opportunities, including sports. They have cultural activities. They have activities that comport with their religious beliefs. And it is our full belief that they have the highest standards of care that we can provide. Okay. Uh, any did anybody disagree with that, that they're well treated? Uh, no, sir. And I've been so down there on a number of visits. So they're well treated. So there's no... May there's I no, uh, May I comment, sir? Yes, go right ahead. Um, I serve. Speak up and bring that uh, microphone close to you when you're talking. Everybody seems to be very worried I've been in the camps. That. Uh, this is Colonel David. I've been in the camps. I've uh, met with different detainees. Uh, as an LSO commander, I sent my 
attorneys to work for JTF Gitmo SJ's office. In fact, several years ago, I served as the interim SJ for a short period of time uh, with Joint Task Force Guantanamo. I can say um, that with very few exceptions, the men and women are members of the Guard Force, of members of the uh, medical staff, have provided excellent uh, treatment to the detainees. However, uh, there have been circumstances, there have been occasions when detainees have been mistreated. And that has happened. It has not happened regularly. And I'm not talking about the issue of whether or not uh, uh, certain types of uh, interrogation methods are torture or not. I'm talking about mistreatment. That has happened. Uh, but it has happened uh, on occasion, not regularly. And the vast majority of the people down there are doing tremendous jobs under very difficult circumstances. But I just wanted to clarify the record from my perspective that it is not a 100 percent true statement, in my opinion, that they're treated uh, well and have been treated well all the time. Well, I ask if the question was, are they, are they being treated well now? I think is that what's your opinion? Do you see uh, deficiencies? I think there have been occasions, not recently, uh, that they have not been treated as we would like them to be treated, I believe. Okay. How long ago? I think the most recent incident that I'm aware of is probably within the last 60 days, sir. Okay. What happened? I'm not sure how much I can talk about that in this forum. Well, you got us there. You, you tell us you saw something bad, but you can't, no, sir. You can't no, tell us what no, it was. No, sir. I did not see anything bad. It's, it's information provided to me which suggests that that incident occurred, and we brought it to the attention of... Okay. So if, a, if an incident occurs, we, assure, we assume people aren't perfect and you're not going to have a prison without having some incident at some point. Uh, is disciplinary action taken? Sometimes that's a little hard to ascertain exactly what happens as an end result. We don't get a full um, briefing or after action as to exactly what happened. Um, sometimes that information is a little incomplete. How about finding out for us and letting us know? Certainly. You're a little vague on it, so find out the specific I'm, facts. I'm a little vague because uh, I don't have all those specifics. Okay, yes, sir. we'll bring it in and tell it to us. Now, let me ask you a question about that. Uh, my understanding is there's never been a murder at Guantanamo. Is that right? A murder? That's correct. Okay. Is there any other prison in the world, major prison, where there's never been a murder besides Guantanamo? If you're asking me, sir, I would assume there is not, although I don't, I don't know. Do any of you other folks know of any other prison in the world where there's never been a murder except Guantanamo, major prison? I don't think there is one. I think it's got, in terms of having a capital crime committed in the prison, I think it's got, it's the only one in the world where there's never been a murder. I've heard lots of my colleagues uh, criticize Guantanamo, and I've looked at the records of, of murders, assaults, uh, and other problems in their particular districts in their state and local prisons. And uh, Guantanamo's record looks pretty sterling compared to it. But I wanted to bring this out because I think this is the, f the framework under which we're undertaking this hearing is that somehow Guantanamo has a stigma. Uh, is there a practice that we undertake right now that you think, uh, any of you think is a, uh, uh, because I was there and I saw them, I saw us, uh, we read the Koran to them over the loudspeaker system, I think, what, five times a day. Uh, we provide a taxpayer paid for Koran, prayer beads, rugs. Uh, I looked at their medical records. Uh, they'd averaged about a five pound per person weight gain over the year. Uh, is there any uh, particular procedure that we undertake that you think is an oppressive procedure that we should change, an official procedure? Anybody have a suggestion? I have none, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Congressman. Well, then here's my question for you. Uh, outside of geography, that is the fact that Guantanamo is located where it is, and it's, uh, it's considered to be an extension of American authority because of, ge of the geography, is there a good reason to close Guantanamo? 
assuming that we're, we're continuing to have this war against terrorists uh, and that we incarcerate people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who does say that he planned the attack that killed thousands of men, women, and children, and we have to put them somewhere and nobody wants them in their congressional district, uh, is there a reason, a compelling reason for us to close Guantanamo? Well, the Secretary and, and the President have consistently stated that we are trying to move towards the day when we can close the facility and have trying to take those efforts that we can to do so in light of some of the international criticism and other concerns that have raised over the detention facility. Well, we, we know what they've said, but my, my question to you is, is there a compelling reason outside of the geography? Because the court has now attached certain rights to people who are incarcerated in Guantanamo, uh, and most important of which, obviously, is a, the right to habeas. Is there, a, is there a compelling reason outside of the geography uh, to close Guantanamo? If we have good people, as everybody concurs we have, incarcerating these folks, we have uh, good care, good treatment, good food, good health care, is there a compelling reason to close Guantanamo? The Department of Defense would certainly not be in a position to provide better treatment in another location than the treatment that it provides at Guantanamo okay. Bay. Okay, let me ask. Um, just, just for the record, sir, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I do believe it would be appropriate to close Guantanamo Bay. I, I don't, I don't want to not say that. I don't want to okay. interrupt you. Why do you? That's what I'm, I'm asking the question, so you can get your two cents worth in. Why do you think we should close it? I think first and foremost. Uh, because it is a blight on our legal integrity. And the fact that a detainee at Guantanamo Bay is being fed appropriately, that's wonderful. That's who we are. We're Americans. We're going to take care of people. But the fact that they do not have the right to counsel until they're charged, the fact that only recently the Supreme Court extended some constitutional rights to the detainees at Guantanamo Bay. I think one can begin to build and certainly build a case uh, bit by bit by bit, things that have occurred um, that justifies that if we're going to charge someone with a crime that faces a life sentence or death or a long time in prison, we can do better than detaining them at Guantanamo Bay, oh. if for no other reason to make them more accessible to the court system, more accessible to the men and women that need to defend them. I think the issue may be where we put and how we house the individuals that we never intend to charge, and politically we may never intend to release, but my function as Chief Defense Counsel is to defend zealously those people that have been charged, and I don't believe Guantanamo Bay is an appropriate place for them to be, and I don't believe that's the best place, and I believe we can do better, sir. Okay. Well, so my question to you is, you've, you've said they're not being maltreated at Guantanamo Bay, but you, what your, your uh, complaint is you think the system is mistreating them. We're not treating them. We're not giving them all the rights that you feel they should be, uh, they should be given, but that's not – that's not something that's driven by geography or where you put them. You could have, uh, you could apply the full rights of the Constitution to people at Guantanamo Bay if the country decides to do that, right? In those, in the, in the proceedings for people, that's not, that isn't something that is derived from the location. That's something that's derived from our justice system. Is that not true? It is certainly true from the standpoint of geography, but again, it is difficult, if not impossible, to apply our laws at this time to the facility, to the operation of the facility, to the due process for those individuals. I, so, okay, that's something that's hard to understand here. How do? You, why can't you apply the law to the any uh, and the any mechanism that is passed by Congress, signed by the president, with respect to either this? the Detainee Treatment Act or, the, uh, or this uh, military justice system or, or uh, the ter so-called Terrorist Tribunal Act that we have now put into law, that's not uh, specific to a particular piece of geography. What's the problem here, Colonel? I mean, can you, are you saying that defense counsel don't have a place to stay when they come to Guantanamo, that they're, they're, they don't have access to counsel? 
that's been uh, problematic in the past. I mean, I unfortunately I wasn't consulted in the in the operation. Uh, I'm not in, in charge of that. Well, let me ask you other folks. Do you sure. see a, a problem with Defense Council being being allowed access to Guantanamo or having enough quarters or transportation or? We have made uh, extraordinary efforts since the charging of these uh, individuals in 2007 to uh, provide support for all participants in the trial process at Guantanamo. We have built a brand new courtroom. We have built a uh, put together temporary quarters for all participants so that uh, we can okay. provide everyone okay. their opportunity. Okay, let me so let me do this, Colonel. Role. Yes, Why don't you get us a, a defense counsel to contact the committee who says that he traveled, he tried to travel to Guantanamo, where he traveled to Guantanamo and could not find adequate quarters, it was not, uh, was not allowed to, uh, to uh, have a place from which he could operate to defend his particular client. You get us that information. If that's your, if that's your claim. My, my claim is not as it relates to accommodations. We have accommodations. My claim is it relates to getting to and from. My claim as it relates to okay. most recently is taking down my new counsel for an orientation, expected orientation of Guantanamo Bay since they have the appropriate security clearances and I wanted them to have an opportunity as the prosecution to have a briefing, have an orientation, unclassified briefing, only to have that planned and the day before canceled because I was told it was not, in a, not appropriate for defense counsel to have that kind of orientation. But I will certainly get you details, sir. Okay, but they have a place to stay. Absolutely. But, but you didn't get an orientation you wanted to get. They do have a place to stay, yes, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Dordo, you got to come in on this orientation? Uh, sir, I, I'm aware of that particular request. I do know that the response that went back to Colonel David was if you put it in writing and provide adequate justification so that a decision can be made based on more than just an assertion that it was going to be an orientation, that that request would be considered. Okay, um, uh, uh, you know, we put this law together, and the reason I'm taking some time, and I appreciate uh, Chairman letting me take some time, because this is a very serious matter, and it's one that's got a lot of depth. We put together, we, we examined tribunals that have been held in the past from Nuremberg, Rwanda, et cetera, uh, and the House and Senate worked on this, Democrats and Republican, council, non-council, uh, and the members, and we put together a group of rights that we afford uh, the detainees under the Military Commissions Act, and I'm reading them. The right to counsel, the presumption of innocence, the proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the opportunity to obtain witnesses and other evidence, the right to discovery, exculpatory evidence provided to defense counsel, statements obtained through torture are excluded, classified evidence must be declassified, redacted, or summarized to the maximum extent possible, and we had a lot of problems working this. Democrats and Republicans sent it in the House because you had the problem of having classified information that the accused had a right to confront, and yet you couldn't give classified information out. We finally worked through it to have it to the maximum extent redacted uh, and summarized uh, so that you could have a fair trial and yet you could protect classified information. Statements uh, allegedly obtained through coercion are only admissible if the military ru judge rules that the statement is reliable and probative. A certified impartial judge will preside over all proceedings of the individual commissions. U.S. government must provide defense counsel, including counsel with the necessary clearances, to review classified information on the accused terrorist's behalf. That means you don't keep information away on the basis that he doesn't have counsel. In capital cases, the military commission's 12 panelists must unanimously agree on the verdict and the president has a final review. Panel votes are secret ballot, which ensures panelists are allowed to vote their conscience. We did that because we didn't want to have a, a, a subordinate officer feeling that he had to follow his superior's vote and a particular uh, vote uh, uh, against, a, uh, against a detainee. So we provided for a secret ballot. Uh, right to appeal to a new court of military commissions review and the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and the right against double jeopardy. Now, I read those to counsel for some of the defendants yesterday, and I asked them if there were any additional rights that they would give to the defendants, any specific rights that they think we missed. Not one of them came up with one. 
They talked around it. They talked about the basic. They thought they had the basic rights to to uh, to ha ha be afforded full constitutional rights as U.S. citizens. But none of them came up with one and said, "We think you missed one here." So my question to you, and I'll start with you, Colonel. Uh, beyond those rights, are there additional rights that you think that the defendant should have? Well, I think it would be helpful if the right to counsel arose prior to three or four or five or six years later being charged and prior to interrogations of any kind, however coercive or whether they cross into torture. I think it would also be helpful if some of those rights were played out under the Commission's process more openly and transparently than they have on occasion. For example, the right to discovery of evidence when that discovery is provided to you either in trial or on the eve of trial, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages, it's difficult to, quite frankly, utilize that right effectively and have that right mean anything without causing prejudice to the accused. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any other rights, uh, so I probably would be in the same boat as the men and women yesterday. I'd certainly, if I have an opportunity and could supplement my testimony, sure, I, I will do that. Okay. Um, but, but I think my, my only point on those rights, sir, is that there's a difference in theory and in practice. And I'm concerned that what looks good at 30,000 feet when you're on the ground has been tremendously problematic. Well, th thank you, uh, Colonel, but l let me tell you, courts across the land make mistakes all the time, and, uh, and uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, plaintiff's lawyers, uh, including myself, uh, complain, uh, have complained uh, that we didn't get timely discovery, and you have a right, when you have discovery, you have a right to timely discovery. Uh, statements obtained by torture are excluded under the law, so we pass a law, and if it's not followed, of course, that's reversible error in a case. And, uh, and you get a reversal on your, uh, so carrying out the law is of course an important thing. And I, if you have any, uh, um, any particular incidents of not getting timely discovery, uh, I'd, I'd like you to get those to the committee. And if you have any further, uh, on reflection, any further ideas on, on ways to make this system more fair uh, and, uh, and uh, a, a better form, please get those to us. I think we'd appreciate that. And uh, uh, last thing, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me take some time, but the problem is this stuff takes some time. Uh, the last thing is this. If you've been given uh, uh, the right to habeas, uh, that's, and I've never had a habeas case, but that's basically that you're being held unlawfully. The heart of that case, for practical purposes, if, you're a, if you've been picked up on a battlefield, is going to be I would think, in a practical way, whether you are a combatant or whether you were the farmer in a field, you were a person who maybe had an AK-47 because you were, uh, you were one of the uh, livestock protectors in a town, you got picked up on a sweep, you shouldn't be there. The problem is the details of that uh, are going to be long since uh, the, the principles in that, in that, uh, that military sweep are going to be long since dissipated uh, from the scene. And this is not like a crime scene where you have a lot of people attend uh, the scene of a, of, a, uh, of a crime and you have lots of uh, expert capability focusing. A lot of these folks are picked up on in battlefield operations that are very transitory, very quick. Uh, and, and the idea, if, if, you're a, if you're the court trying to figure out what you review in the habeas, what do you think? And I'd ask uh, uh, maybe Mr. Diorto could could answer this. What do you do? You see problems with the court being able to figure out what the scope of their review is going to be. Uh, you get a guy that was picked up in an Afghan village uh, four years ago. What are you going to be able to do to ascertain the merit of his habeas uh, appeal? Well, Congressman Hunter, I think it's going to be a difficult process. I mean, it it will be. 
it, it will be a question of, I would assume, the detainee uh, presenting at some point his view of why he should not be held, uh, countered by the government's information, which will be largely from battlefield reports, reports filed th by those who captured him, who brought him into their custody, uh, matching up intelligence reports uh, that would come from a variety of sources, many of which are going to be very sensitive and highly classified. They will be the means by which we obtain that information. They will be the sources and methods. In, in many instances, there will be information coming from foreign governments that want that information protected. And so while in the system that we have now, under the CSER process and the ARB process, many of those things will be considered by uh, military officers who have some knowledge of what this is all about and certainly can assess the intelligence value of the information that's been brought forward. Judges may not be as able to uh, pour through that and make the assessments that they need to make on that sort of information. And then if we start getting into what the detainee needs to be provided to allow him to rebut that information, it will be a very, very difficult uh, process of trying to take that classified information and develop an unclassified summary that the detainee can, can be shown that will satisfy the judge that the detainee has had enough information to permit him to respond. It, is a, it will be very, very difficult, and it is one of these, the difficulties associated with this type of warfare. Okay. Well, thank you. And I, I know the chairman is an expert in this area and uh, has tried a lot of cases, and I know he's got some uh, questions to it. It just looks to me like the, the practical aspect of making this determine, laying out a template for what habeas is, what the scope of the review is going to be, and whether our guys are going to be able, uh, the judge is going to be able to really accomplish a, a meaningful uh, habeas review is, I think, uh, uh, questionable. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me some time on this. You bet, Mr. Spread. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Boumediene makes it clear that the detainees at Guantanamo have the right to petition for habeas corpus. Do you believe that the decision also allows them the full panoply of rights that comes with habeas corpus that would come to an ordinary defendant seeking habeas corpus? Or is there some diminished status, some diminished a bag of rights, that, a collection of rights that they have. Is that, is that part and parcel of the, the uh, Attorney General's request to us to write the law that we may have the authority to diminish the associated rights that they have? Uh, no, the, the, what, what Boumediene says is, um, of course, they, uh, the detainees have a right to petition for habeas corpus the Attorney General's... Well, let me ask you this. Can Congress take constitutional rights away? No. If this is a constitutional right, the right to habeas corpus, can we diminish it? You, you can't eliminate the right to habeas corpus. You can certainly uh, pass statutes that um, define the procedures to be used, the standards of proof. As I said, you have done that with respect to habeas corpus. Uh, Let me ask you this, does the, does the department take the position that Congress has the authority to strip courts, federal courts, of the right to review habeas corpus petitions? The Supreme Court has struck down a strip. Uh, what, is n what we are now proposing is legal standards to govern the exercise of the detainee's habeas corpus rights. And I should add that the Attorney General's specific proposals are consistent with all of the rights recognized in Boumediene and all of the rights previously recognized by the Supreme Court in Hamdi. Let's take coercive testimony, coercive evidence obtained through coercive means. Is that admissible on the same basis as it would be admitted or excluded in, in uh, non-detainee cases and ordinary uh, criminal cases? Evidence, I, evidence improperly seized, um, obtained, would be excluded. 
What about the right to confront those who have made accusations against you? Uh, the confrontation rights of the Sixth Amendment would not apply because enemy combatant proceedings are not criminal proceedings, and the Sixth Amendment, even for citizens in this country, applies only to criminal prosecutions. So there, was, there is no right then to have witnesses who have made charges, accusations against you, confront you personally, face to face, in open court? Well, if if that means that the only way to support a detention uh, is for service members to be summoned back from uh, the battlefield to give eyewitness testimony as opposed to um, a hearsay affidavit, uh, we think the answer should be is and should be no, as the Supreme Court recognized in the Hamdi case when it specifically said that use of hearsay in these circumstances would be permissible. What about exculpatory evidence? This is a matter of fairness. Should the defendant have the access to it, including detainees here, or is there right to exculpatory evidence somehow less than the right of an ordinary criminal defendant? The essence of the habeas proceedings that the Supreme Court has mandated is that the detainee be able to put on whatever evidence he wishes. Um, we don't think that um, that entails a right to compel the government to search through all of, its all of its records worldwide for any evidence that might exist anywhere um, due to uh, classification concerns, burdens on the military, um, and the lack of any uh, precedent for applying that kind of <coughs> criminal standard in these very different enemy combatant proceedings. So what we're, what we're seeing is that though the court has ruled that the detainees have the right to habeas corpus, once they exercise that right and try to show that they are not guilty of anything that would justify their being further held, their rights, their procedural rights, are less than the procedural rights of an ordinary criminal defendant in the federal court. Well, absolutely, Mr. Spratt. The, the Supreme Court in Boumediene said explicitly that the extent of procedural protections in habeas corpus need not, not track the extent of protections in criminal prosecutions in domestic Article III courts. They were quite explicit on that point. Boumediene holds that. Boumediene does does not definitively answer the question of how much procedure the detainees are entitled to, but it does say that the procedure need not match the amount of procedure for a domestic criminal trial. Colonel Davis, how do you read the uh, decision? Excuse me. I believe the decision is 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 clear that neither citizenship nor sovereignty status is dispositive. Instead. Uh, the court quoted whether a constitutional provision has extraterritorial effect depends on the particular circumstances and practical necessities and the possible alternatives. I think they were not satisfied with the alternatives. They made it clear that habeas will extend, and I think um, there's certainly a precedent there that uh, other constitutional rights uh, will apply to the detainees charged before the commissions in Guantanamo Bay, as I stated earlier. Um, and if necessary, those will be litigated one by one. But I certainly believe it's a broader read it, right reading. Um. Mr. Costas, uh, the, can I have one more question? The, uh, the Attorney General sent us a letter on July the 21st uh, with key, six key points that he would like to see in legislation that the Congress writes. The first is that the law should prohibit federal courts from ordering the government to bring enemy combatants into the United States. Well, what is the purpose of that? The purpose of that is um, safeguarding the security of this country. It seems, um, it seems unwise to um, allow potentially dangerous people uh, into the country to roam free uh, in our midst. Well, they'd be in custody of the military, were they not? They uh, may or may not be may or may not be in custody. I would think that other things equal custody at a secure 
foreign military base on a remote island is safer than uh, custody in New York City or Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Mr. McHugh from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, I, wa I want to pursue Mr. Spratt's last point a little bit. Um, and, and I would preface it by saying I think the very interesting discussion uh, between uh, Mr. Katsis and Colonel David as to what this court decision conveys as with respect to constitutional rights and what the provision of habeas means here, given the absence of guidance by the court, which is also at the crux of all, all four of the dissenters in this case, show the peril in which this case has left us because we truly don't know what this ruling means in terms of conveyed rights. And, and Colonel, I, I respect your opinion, and you may well be right that there is a, a clear indication that these uh, combatants being held are entitled under our Constitution to additional rights. And while I would say to Mr. Katzis, I would probably agree with your analysis and your arguments as to what you believe, I suspect before Boumediene came down, you believe that there was no right to habeas either, so we don't know. Let's talk about the 60, roughly, uh, individuals at Guantanamo who you expect at some point will have no status there. They've been processed and ready for release, but they have nowhere to go, either because for our purposes, we would not release them to certain countries. For other purposes, those country, other countries wouldn't take them. Is there not at least a question of uncertainty that at some point in a process of habeas, a judge who will be looking at this as a result of the, the Boumediene decision will say you must release these people into the United States? Is that not a possibility? Absolutely, it's a possibility. We have one pending motion in which a detainee has requested precisely that. Would that not take us back to Attorney General McCasey's first point that he, he's concerned about that possibility? Those people could, and I assume in that circumstance, would not be under custody. They'd be free to roam. True? The, the, the request is for release into the country. Yeah. Colonel, would you disagree with that analysis, that potential? I think certainly the potential is there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Colonel, um, I, I followed or I tried to follow very carefully your discussion with the ranking member with respect to uh, uh, the facility at Guantanamo. And, and, and quite, quite frankly, I tended to agree with the ranking member that uh, the concerns you have weren't necessarily embedded into a facility per se, they were largely procedural, although I, I recognize there's a geography issue uh, in transport and such that you have. But I made an assumption as to what I believe your position was, and I don't think making an assumption on your position on my part is fair, so I want to ask you. My assumption is listening uh, to what you said you would believe that the only fair location in which to operate this kind of system and have this kind of facility would be in CONUS in the United States. Am I making a correct assumption? Yes, sir. With respect to those detainees being charged, uh, my opinion would be that they could be transferred to and tried within the federal criminal justice system or under the UCMJ or even under some sort of quasi-federal special court. Here in the United States? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I didn't, I didn't feel it was fair to you to assume that, and I'm glad we got it on the record. The other, um, the other assumption, that, that I think you answered yourself, but I want to I give you a chance to more clearly define if you choose to. I also heard you say, but before that I was assuming your belief is that Boumediene suggests very clearly that the detainees at Guantanamo have 
a wider range, and as you just said, will be argued and ultimately held, they have a wider range of constitutional rights uh, than just this narrowly defined habeas, true? Yes, sir. Okay. I think that issue is, is obviously not answered or that question is not answered. I'm asking your belief. But, but yes, I your do. Your belief, all right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Del Orto, you, you said in the beginning in your statement, and you, you read it here, that the dual track process that provided under this ruling, as well as that provided under the Detainee Act, uh, provides to those detainees more appellate rights than a United States citizen. I heard you correctly. Yes, sir. I just want to be clear, for the record, I would argue it also affords more rights of appeal than are afforded to the people who are guarding them, the men and women who wear the uniform of this country. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, sir. And if I could append a, a point um, on your previous question, uh, in point of fact, if you take Colonel David's argument to its logical conclusion, he would be arguing that by virtue of this decision, uh, a detainee at Guantanamo has more rights under the Constitution than our servicemen and women have under the Uniform Code of Military Justice because there are certain constitutional rights that are constrained uh, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Well, uh, in fairness to the Colonel, I didn't, I didn't hear him say, he may believe, I didn't hear him say all constitutional rights are conveyed, I did, did, but, but I, I appreciate your comment. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask one more question. Thank you, sir. I would say to, uh, to Mr. Katzis, I, I think your analysis of the conveyance of right to confront under, and by the way, for the record, I dropped out of law school after 10 days, so jump in here and correct me at any time, but for my limited knowledge, that the right of uh, confrontation under the Sixth Amendment is, is normally considered a civil finding um, and would not be applied here, you would argue, uh, you and I would agree in that argument, but would I be wrong to be concerned that there too, there could be a court determination in the future as they fill in these considerable blanks left by this decision that that right of confrontation should be extended to detainees. Does that concern you? In, in the habeas proceedings or the prosecutions? Either. In, in the prosecutions, that is an open question, but the Military Commissions Act already provides confrontation rights by statute. If with it were provided under a Sixth Amendment right, one of a right that we would argue is not yet extended, but could be as the blanks were filled in, it is my understanding that a true confrontation under the traditional aspects would be held here in the United States in federal court over on Constitution Avenue. Is that true? If if the, if the proceedings were conducted here, then... Is that not standard procedure in a Sixth Amendment confrontation uh, before federal court? The, the habeas proceedings would be conducted here. If confrontation rights were extended, then the detainees uh, would be here in Washington, D.C. at Third and Constitution Northwest. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in closing, I, I would say, look, and, and Colonel David, He's doing a great job representing the interests of his clients, and that's his job, and I respect him for it, and I, I can feel very certain he comes committed to his passion, but, and, and he may have points, probably does have points that need to be carefully considered, but I, I would refer in closing to the Attorney General's comments, and without saying he's all right or all wrong, I, I think these are points that we have to carefully consider. And, and there, in my opinion, are far too many blanks here in far too many important ways as, as is embedded in, in much of the dissent opinions, uh, for those who have read it, that it's incumbent upon us to step in and be heard and fill in some of those blanks that uh, I think cry out for definition. So that's why this hearing is important, why I personally deeply appreciate all four of you being here. And um, thank you all for your service, and thank you for your patience, too, as well as yours, Mr. Chairman. I would yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy, questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would agree with the, my colleague from New York, Mr. McHugh, on his, on his past statement. I, I do want to, before I get to my question, uh, Mr. Del Wardo, I, I would, 
I know you're an Army officer for 27 years, and, and again, I appreciate the whole panel for being here. I, I do want to mention, though, that you actually get more rights as a soldier, as you know, uh, when it comes to criminal law, whether it's our, uh, Fifth Amendment rights, because you get the Article 31B rights as compared to Miranda, and you get Sixth Amendment right to counsel in the military as compared to in the civilian world where you, you have, to have, have to be indigent to get a right to counsel for free of charge and you get free attorneys in the military. But I know you don't get First Amendment freedom of speech rights and others, but again, we could have it. I, I know you're a Notre Dame grad. I went to King's College, another Holy Cross school, but you went on to Pepperdine and St. John's and, and uh, Georgetown, and I don't want to match, match wits with you uh, or with the board. I, uh, I'm just a lowly constitutional law professor from West Point before I got this gig. So uh, let, me, let me go to my, my question. Uh, Mr. Katzis, Katzis, pursuant to the authority uh, granted under the uh, AUMF, do you believe that an old lady in Switzerland who sends a check to an orphanage in Afghanistan can be taken into custody as an enemy combatant if unbeknownst to her, some of her donation is passed to Al Qaeda terrorists? I don't, and I should add that uh, Judge Green, whom you were quoting, went on to say that she believed that that hypothetical does not describe any Guantanamo. Well, detail. I'm actually quoting it. You know, I would say that you're, then you disagree with the statement of Deputy Associate Attorney General Brian Boyle, who in federal district court in 2004 responded to that very question I just asked you by saying that the grandmother could be held because, and I quote, someone's intention is clearly not a factor that would disable detention, end quote. So I'm puzzled. I mean, what's the government's formal position on the outer limits of who can be detained under the AUMF? Under the AUMF, uh, uh, nations, organizations, or persons who committed the September 11 attacks or harbored those who did um, are proper objects of military force, including detention. In general, what that means at a minimum is that Al-Qaeda fighters and Taliban fighters can be detained because Al-Qaeda is the organization that committed the attacks and the Taliban is the armed force of the nation that harbored Al-Qaeda. Um, I fully agree with you to the extent your line of questioning suggests that there will be difficult questions at the outer bounds of who counts as Al-Qaeda, um, what happens to someone who is not actually fighting but writing checks? W you know, is someone who occasionally writes a check different from someone who looks more like an army paymaster? Um, the existence of those hard questions at the outer margins I don't think changes the fundamental point that Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters are subject to detention and our, our fundamental concern is with the core principle because as I said in my opening remarks, we had four out of nine judges on the Fourth Circuit conclude that no member of Al Qaeda could be detained, not even Osama bin Laden. Which would be the minority. And, and that seems. Which would be a minority decision. A, a bare minority. Okay, I just want to make sure that we're accurate that American people are watching on C-SPAN. Well, let me follow up. The, Colonel David, do you believe that the AUMF applies to individuals who have no direct connection to Al-Qaeda or the Taliban and who have not engaged in belligerent acts towards the United States? With that general proposition, I would hope so. Thank you. Um, in response uh, through the uh, Boumedi decision, Attorney General uh, McKay called on Congress to pass legislation that basically codifies the administration's broad and, in my opinion, constitutionally suspect definition of who the government can detain as an enemy combatant pursuant to the AUMF. And, and you heard me earlier say, we're, you know, we're trying to find a balance here. Obviously, we're looking at the spectrum. You know, on one hand, there's the Miranda rights on the battlefield, which no one on this committee, and 99% of us in America don't agree that when you're fighting enemy combatants, they don't get constitutional rights on the battlefield, and we don't give them Miranda uh, warnings or Article 31B warnings, as we call them in, in military justice. But on the other hand, I think most Americans say, listen, we have hundreds of folks that have been detained in Guantanamo Bay for, for over six years now. You know, what's going on with them? And that's why we had this decision as far as, you know, give them at least a grant of habeas corpus. So with all due respect to, to the Attorney General's proposal 
I don't think it's serious or realistic. And he knows full well that this Congress will not approve legislation granting the government power that broad, nor in my opinion should it. Uh, as Judge Wilkinson said, who I think you would all agree is a conservative judge, uh, he said, Judge Wilkerson uh, of the Fourth Circuit Court wrote in the Al Mary case, and I quote, to turn every crime that might tenuously be linked to terrorism into a military matter would breach this country's most fundamental values, end quote. I think the American people, Mr. Chairman, are, are tired of, of blatant partisanship from this administration, has displayed too many times when it comes to national security issues over the past seven years. So I think we're trying to get after it right now on, on trying to find a proper balance. So could the panel please give this committee a realistic idea of how future bipartisan legislation would define who exactly the government can detain while not breaching our country's most fundamental values? And I would ask that panel to please answer that question. Whoever wants to go first. The administration agrees with um, the quote from Judge Wilkinson that you just read. Uh, the Attorney General, um, I'm pretty confident, would not disagree with it. I think a good start would be confirming the power of the military to detain members of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. And Mr. Chair, I know my time's up. May I no, go ahead and pr proceed. Well, I, 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 I would agree with you. I think we could all agree that if it's an al-Qaeda member or a Taliban member or anyone that harbors al-Qaeda or Taliban, we want to be able to go after them. No one in this room is disagreeing with you. What we are arguing, though, is that how do you find out if they are Taliban or al-Qaeda? And how tenuous the, uh, the connection does it have to be? No doubt there are, on, on the question how tenuous the connection has to be, as I said, there no doubt um, there are hard questions on the outer bounds of that, and if you were to um, try to specify a more precise definition of who, who is sufficiently related to Al-Qaeda to be subject to detention, we'd be happy but, to work with But, sir, with, with all due respect, I mean, you're, you're a member of the administration. We're asking for your professional opinion here as we're trying to craft very important legislation that, that you know, is dealing with a very important issue dealing with national security. We're asking you for your professional opinion. As I mentioned, give us a realistic idea of how in the future, what kind of bipartisan legislation do we need and how can we make that connection? Who, you know, how do we move forward from here? I, I, sorry, I, I think I just gave it to you. Um, my professional opinion is that it would be both constitutional and prudent to confirm the, pre the military's authority to detain Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and associated forces. And to come back to your other question about how do we determine who falls within that circle, Supreme Court has spoken. The answer is through habeas corpus proceedings. And now the task, I hope, for the political branches working together is to spell out the details of how those proceedings should be implemented. Well, I, I think part, part of the issue, and we had a very important hearing yesterday, and I think one of the, um, I think it was Neil, uh, Neil Cattell who said only half of a single trial completed after seven years uh, of, Guant of the existence of Guantanamo Bay. And, uh, you know, there's an argument whether or not we should have a national security court. There's a lot of issues that we're trying to wrap our arms around. And, you know, I'd ask the other members of the panel if they would like to to mention it, I know uh, Sandra and Hawkinson, you know, we served actually at the same time in Iraq together. I know you were on the civilian side in CPA. I was uh, south of you. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to live in the green zone, uh, although that was not nice duty. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I used to bring my legal team there to go swim in a pool because we didn't have showers at the time. We weren't. We were a bunch of paratroopers that didn't smell real good there. But, uh, you know, I'd love to hear it if you have, and I know you have the experience as well, being a JAG attorney. and. Um, you know, if you have a comment on my question, I would appreciate to hear it. Well, I, one thing that I think is important to note, and I, and I know we're talking a lot about Boumediene and Guantanamo, but we've, we've captured, as you know, you know, well over 100,000 people since the beginning of this particular war, and a very small number 
through battlefield screening ever ended up at Guantanamo Bay. And so while we agree that it can be difficult to define who fits within these narrow definitions, the hope is that after different levels of hearings, whether they're battlefield or whether they're a combatant status review tribunal or an administrative review board, gets us to a degree of more confidence that at least we're holding the people who pose a real threat to us. Because I want to assure everybody here in the room that we have no desire to hold anybody who doesn't fit in that category or pose a threat to the United States. Um, I think just to pick up on your broader question, as we, as we move forward, and I think there are a lot of important issues that have been addressed in the Attorney General's testimony, but also discussed here about just Sorry. practical ways to try to ensure that these habeas proceedings can proceed as quickly and efficiently as possible to have those very determinations made um, so that we can move forward. And, and, the and the decisions can be made by the courts. And, and in the meantime, I can assure you that we're going to do everything that we can to continue to transfer out those detainees that can be transferred in Guantanamo Bay and to continue to try to shrink the population as we look at the other op alternatives that are out there. Okay. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment? Uh, Congressman, I would, uh, in terms of the definition, I would suggest that you might want to look first at Section 948A of the Military Commissions Act, uh, which obviously was passed by, by Congress in uh, 2006 and signed by the President shortly thereafter. That at least, I think, from the standpoint of jurisdiction of the military commissions, gives you a definition which is very, very similar to that which was adopted very early on for the purposes of the C Combatant Status Review Tribunal uh, process. So those definitions are out there. and. We think they are operable definitions, and we think that they have served us well to date uh, in the, the war on terror. On. Colonel, you have any comments? I know. Put, put the mic on, please. My concern right now is what happens to those individuals that are charged. Uh, I think we all agree that or at least I hope we agree that when all is said and done, and whether you were a prosecutor or defense counsel, the discussion centers on, gosh, the evidence I could have called or the witness I could have called or, or uh, something I could have done differently, and whether someone's found guilty or not guilty and what the sentence is, the discussion is about that and not for years to come about the process or the flaws in the process or the problems with the process. I think that is a goal we all, sh all share. The problem is how we get there and the concerns we're trying to bring forth in the litigation and in any form we can is that the process, the commission's process has flaws. and. You know, I'm concerned. I don't want anyone murdered in a prison, but I don't want someone dying there of old age because they've been held there uh, for an extended period of time without due process. I think we're better than that, and I, uh, I don't envy your challenge. I know we had testimony. My last comment, Chairman, I know my time has expired, but along those lines, uh, Colonel, yesterday we had testimony from Colonel Morris Davis from, from the Air Force. and. Uh, he quoted actually the prosecutor from the World War II saboteur case where he wrote in 2001, right after 9-11 attacks, he said, and his name is Mr. Cutler, he said, we'll see in 2001 and after 2001 that we know more about the United States on how we prosecute Al-Qaeda members and that what that will say just as much about us as it will say about Al-Qaeda. Well, sir, I'm just a small town Indiana boy. Um, but I wouldn't want to drive a 1940s vintage automobile, and I wouldn't want to be operated on in a 1940s vintage hospital. So I think as painful as it may be for us as a country, in the long run, uh, giving the detainees a 21st century legal rights is the right thing to do, and so we can stand up in front of the world, and we did it right, and we have no excuses, and we're not subject to ridicule and criticism, and our legal integrity is maintained, and we have defended the rule of law. I think that's what we're about. Yeah, and I, I would go back to the chairman. I it is so for those folks that are home watching, the chairman's a former county prosecutor in, in Missouri, um, a military historian, and I just want those people that are home in America to realize that we're not asking 
to give any type of Miranda rights on the battlefield. If it's Al Qaeda or Taliban, we want to prosecute them to the fullest extent. And in my opinion, I think death is appropriate judgment if that's the case. But at the same time, if there are people that are locked up in Guantanamo Bay that were there for wrong reasons, whether meaning they were turned over because they got a bounty or whatever reason, you know, now that they have the rights under habeas corpus, which I think we should have passed as a Congress, we didn't get there, even though we had legislation and just didn't come up for a vote yet before the Supreme Court ruled in this decision. But I, we're getting after it now, and uh, it's something that I'm very proud of, and I yield back to the Chairman. Well, thank the gentleman. Uh, uh, Ike, let me, say, let me say one last thing. Mr. Hunter? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for letting me uh, make uh, one last uh, statement here. Uh, once again, we've, uh, Colonel, you talked about 21st rights, uh, 21st century rights. Uh, the right to have counsel is a 21st century right. Uh, the, uh, the right to, uh, to be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt is a 21st century right. These, fifth, these 15 rights that I enumerated, which so far nobody has been able to expand upon, including you, uh, are 21st century rights. And of course, we expect the system to carry those rights out. Now, if you see people not carrying those rights out, we expect to know about that. Uh, but I don't want to let the, this uh, hearing conclude with the idea that somehow we are summarily uh, convicting people without affording them their rights. We aren't doing that. And I also know that we have given, uh, we have given a free pass to people who were incarcerated in Guantanamo, and they've gone back and they've picked up arms, and they've tried to kill Americans again on the battlefields. That means the people that come from our towns like people come from Mr. Murphy's town and people come from my town in San Diego and the people come from the chairman's towns. And we have an obligation to the people that fight on the battlefield to make sure that the guys that they've gone to, that they've, they have, uh, have given blood, sweat, and tears to bring those people in to, when they capture them. And the idea of us having a system uh, where Ty goes to the runner and we jettison those people back to the battlefield to make ourselves feel good instead of warehousing them for the duration of this war is a disservice to them. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the, the panel being here uh, today, Mr. Chairman, but I also appreciate the fact that we did put a bill together. I think it's a good bill. And uh, I noticed the Colonel that was with us yesterday did say he thought that the, that the, uh, uh, the MCA is a good, uh, a good uh, basis for the prosecution of, of uh, people who are accused of terrorism against the United States. I want to see these prosecutions continue. I think we all do. I think everybody here does. Uh, and I want to thank the panel for being with us. Uh, lastly, I, I think it's a real mistake for us to close Guantanamo because the rest of the world doesn't like it. Uh, the rest of the world goes behind closed doors after Americans go out to the far reaches of the world and risk our lives trying to bring these guys to justice. Uh, and they breathe a sigh of relief after the Americans do it. Then they can hold press conferences and say that we didn't give Khalid Sheikh Mohammed all of the rights that he was entitled to while, we were, while our guys were out there risking their lives to bring him in. I think we've done a pretty darn good job of this thing so far. Uh, and I think it's a mistake for our political figures, including those in my party, uh, to say that they're going to close Guantanamo to somehow do away with this image uh, that's falsely been built up around this system of justice. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having the hearing today. Back to the legislative issue. There is um, a law in the books called the Classified Information Procedures Act. The Attorney General mentioned in his speech before the uh, American Enterprise Institute that there should be legislation uh, in relation to habeas corpus proceedings uh, that are related, of course, to the status of detainees, that the Classified Information Procedures Act is inadequate. I am asking uh, Mr. Katz's Upon what basis does the Attorney General make that assertion? The Classified Information Procedures Act governs criminal trials outside 
the wartime context in domestic Article III courts. The question before you today is appropriate procedures for wartime status determinations in a non-criminal context um, for aliens captured and held outside the country. The fundamental problem with applying the Classified Information Procedures Act in this very different context is that ultimately um, the Classified Information Procedures Act in many cases puts the government to the Hobson's choice of either revealing classified information or letting somebody go in any case where a judge finds that there is no adequate substitute for classified information. That might be an appropriate uh, burden to impose on the government in the context of criminal prosecution. We don't think it's an appropriate burden in the context of fighting a war. Has uh, the Classified Information Procedures Act been used in any of the uh, trials thus far regarding terrorism, the, of course? In the habeas hearings or the, or the prosecutions? No, in the actual prosecution. Well, we certainly we have uh, the version of the Classified Information Procedures Act that uh, is is different uh, for military commissions that was passed by Congress in the Military Commissions Act. I don't believe we've actually had to uh, employ those procedures yet in uh, the trial that is underway at Guantanamo uh, at this moment. Uh, I could be wrong on that because I don't follow the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, happenings in that particular court. So I could be wrong on that, Mr. Chairman, but I don't believe we've had to uh, employ those procedures yet. And, and I, should say, I should add, it has not yet been used in the habeas proceedings involving detention challenges, although detainee counsel have asked for something like it. D d despite that, if the... Uh, the your department has uh, uh, recommendations along this line. We would appreciate additional information on it uh, for us uh, because it uh, we'd be happy could, to work. It, yes, it, it, it could pose a problem in the future. Currently, you might be interested in knowing that uh, country lawyers do think alike, and, and you, uh, you you had a, some country lawyers up here. Uh, listening to your testimony today. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your patience and your testimony. It's been very, very helpful. And I know it's been a long day for you, but this is the most important uh, subject for us uh, to be considering, and we will uh, obviously be looking at your testimony in the day's head. Thank you so much. Meetings adjourned.